A thought is hard to fathom in the presence of my King, and with countless ones forgiven, gathered round the throne to sing glory and honor. Worthy is the Lamb.
Good evening, church. We're excited you can join us. We're going to begin our Wednesday night Bible study again. We're happy that you can be a part of this. I'm glad that you've carved out the time that we can dig into God's Word together. Just a quick announcement. We're going to be helping some members of the body get moved out of their storage into a U-Haul truck this Saturday. So go ahead and contact me. I'll send you the details. But the more hands, the lighter the work will be. So please volunteer to help if you can. As we begin, let's open in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for this day. We thank you for the blessings of being your children. Father, we love you and we appreciate you. And Father, we thank you for the blessing of this avenue of communicating and studying and still gathering together. Lord, watch over us as we strive to be your children, to do your will in this world. We thank you and we love you. In Christ's name, amen. church. Once again, we're going to continue on in the parables of Jesus. But first, what I'd like to do is I'd like to welcome those at home for tuning in. And if you'd like to follow along, today's par tonight's parable will be the parable of the Good Samaritan. And that's found in Luke chapter 10. And we're going to go from verses 25 to 37. So if you want to turn to your Bibles and follow along, that'd be great. And I'm going to read it right now. First off, this was Jesus uh, talking to his disciples, and then a lawyer came forward to ask him a question. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? What is your reading of it? So he answered and said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And then Jesus said to him, You have answered rightly. Do this, and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself and asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves, who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. 
Now by chance a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise a Levite, when he arrived at the same place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine, and he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So that's the, 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 the scripture reading for the parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, we have that term that's trickled down through the years of, quote, someone being a Good Samaritan. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that say that don't even realize or understand that that's straight from the Bible. But what we're going to do is we're going to break down the parable just a little bit. So when this man was on his way in his travels, he got beat up, robbed, left for dead. And then we don't know how much time had gone by, but at one point there was a priest that walked by, saw the man, looked at him, decided to keep going. And then a time later, and again, we don't know how much time had gone by, there was a Levite that also walked by in the same area, saw the man laying there, made the decision not to do anything at all to help him. And then we have a third person, a Samaritan. He went by where this man was laying, saw him, and had compassion. Got him up on his own animal, probably a, a, a small little donkey, because the man wasn't able to walk. Went to the next town that he was going to. Stopped at an inn, uh, which may be comparable to a, like a hotel or a small cafe or something similar nowadays. Paid out of his own pocket, told the innkeeper, hey, take care of this man. I'm going to give you payment. And if he needs anything further, go ahead and take care of it, and I'll pay you back. I'll repay it on my way back on my travels. Now, it, by, it takes some people a little bit back because Samaritans back in those days were considered basically like a mongrel, like a half-breed, because what happened was the Assyrians went in to the northern part of Israel and when they occupied that, that country, they brought with them different people of different cultures and different races. And what happened was gradually over time, these people intermarried and that created the, the, uh, the race, if you want to call it that, of the Samaritans. So they were considered not pure by the Jewish people. So there's a little bit of animosity, actually quite a bit of animosity and some stigmatism there uh, if you happen to be a Samaritan. Well, anyway, what ended up happening was, is that the, uh, the man, the lawyer asked again, well, who, who is my, ask Jesus, who is my neighbor? And lawyers being how they are sometimes, and I've dealt with lawyers my whole career of work, sometimes they, they don't give you a straight answer, sometimes they try to walk the, the line and not go one way or the other. A lot of times, uh, many lawyers are, shall we say, not as honest as they could be. So it seemed like maybe he was trying to trick Jesus with the thought process, perhaps, of that, okay, I'm going to ask Jesus, who should I consider to be my neighbor? And maybe he may not be able to tell me, or maybe it'll be somebody that I don't really have to show any love or any uh, kindness towards. Well... We know that's not going to be the case. So anyway, what, what were the reasons for the, the priest and the Samaritan for passing this person by? The Bible doesn't really tell us, but we could look at it from one perspective as, that, well, perhaps I didn't want to take the time 
from their own journey to stop and treat this man. Perhaps they just didn't have that kindness in them to do that. But for whatever reason, that is not the thing to do. Now, the, when the Samaritan chose to help this person, we can see that Jesus took a person, meaning the Samaritan, who was considered at that time, like I said, not of a pure, pure race, a half-breed, so to speak, or even a mongrel which, person, which is more harsh words. Now, Jesus chose a person like that to do his good work for him. Now, that should tell us quite a bit. But beside helping the man, the, the Samaritan went the extra mile and paid money out of his own pocket to do that, to help the man. And he told the innkeeper, if we remember, hey, if there's anything more, if this, what I paid you is not enough, if there's any more, basically, a charge or a fee or whatever, let me know, and I'll take care of it when I get back. And then we have an interesting point when Jesus asked the lawyer, which of these three showed compassion as a good neighbor? Well, the lawyer, for whatever reason, maybe he just couldn't bring himself to say the Samaritan because, like I said, they were despised people. But he said the third man, the third person is the one that was the neighbor. He just couldn't bring himself for whatever reason to say the word Samaritan. So that brings us to the point, what kind of neighbor are you? Are you the one that's gonna stop and help this person? Or are you one of the other two that sees what happens, saw what happened to this, this other man that got beat up and robbed and left for dead? Take a look at him and say, well, you know what? I'm sorry this happened to you, but I can't do anything about it right now, but I wish you well and I'm gonna pray for you. Now, does that do anything to help this person? Certainly not. And then that brings us to the second person as well. We don't know what his reason is for not stopping and, and offering some help. He may have had the same reason, same excuse actually. Um, but he decided as well not to stop and help this guy. Now, and is, that, is that what we're called to do? Which neighbor do you want to be? Better yet, let's flip the coin and put yourself as the person that is laying in the road that got beat up and robbed and left for dead. Wouldn't you want somebody to stop and help you? I would venture to say, yes, you would. Now, we don't have really that kind of a situation that comes up very frequently here, but let me just throw something out there from a different perspective. When you see people out in the public area, generally the kind of people I'm referring to are what's considered homeless people. Now, you see them, maybe their, their clothes aren't the cleanest, maybe they're going through a garbage can, maybe they're holding up a little sign that says, hey, I'm, I'm hungry, we'll work for food, something similar of that nature. Now, how do you react to that? Do you just look at the guy and think to yourself, man, that guy's having a pretty bad right now, but you know what, I gotta go to Walmart, or I gotta go over here. So you don't even take the time to take a few minutes to go and see if the, if the person might need anything. Now, through my course of, of work in my job, I've had opportunity to actually stop and talk to some of these homeless people. A big majority of them, contrary to what people think, they're homeless, not through any fault of their own. They may have had some kind of calamity in life, been thrown a situation beyond their control, uh, and end up losing everything. Their family, their home, their job. Uh, and, and sometimes that's, no, like I said, through no fault of their own. And they end up on the street. Now, we don't have any way of knowing that, but is, what is it really going to take for you to spend five or ten minutes out of your day, your very, very busy day, to say, hey, let's go over here. There may be a fast food place nearby and say, hey, if you're hungry, better yet, don't even ask him if he's hungry. Say, hey, let's come over here. I will buy you a meal. And, you know, you never know what, what that's going to make 
somebody's day. Just that little act of kindness, you don't know how that's going to multiply and carry on maybe to the next person and to the next person. Um, you don't know their story. We don't know how they ended up happening to be that way. And then to take that another little step further, I would venture to say that you should consider your neighbor as any person that has a need and that you are able to take care of that need, whatever the case may be. Um, you know, uh, it, it, it could be a variety of different things. And then I would take that a step further. If you're so inclined, make up a little kit that you can keep in, your, in the trunk of your car. Maybe have a couple of bottles of water, some snack foods that, that are prepackaged, maybe a, a small blanket. Because whenever you come across somebody, you don't know what their need may be. You, we just don't know. And a lot of times, that's all it takes, on, on, especially when the, when the weather's like it is now. Somebody's standing on a corner, maybe looking for work or, or just a, some, a bite to eat. By giving them that bottle of water, it doesn't cost you a whole lot, but look at the dividends it's going to pay. And look how important it is for that person that it affects. And like I said, who knows what the trickle-down effect is going to be that that person is going to be doing for someone else. Now, I want to bring up a television show that you may or may not be familiar with, and it's called Undercover Boss. Now, you may be asking yourselves, what does a TV show have to do with the story of the parable of the Good Samaritan? Well, just to condense it briefly, Undercover Boss generally is a person that owns a business, has a big company, whatever. What he does is he decides, he makes the decision to go check out one of his uh, franchises, whether it be like a fast food place or, or uh, you know, manufacturing, something like that. He goes undercover, wears a disguise, so he can go in and see how things are actually run. Maybe to make some improvements, maybe to get on somebody's case. We don't know. He has no way of knowing either. Basically, he's going to spy on some of his employees and see if they're supposed to be doing what they're doing. But what usually ends up happening, as time goes on, as he's undercover, he starts getting to know his employees a little bit better, actually a lot better. Now, he may have lunch with one of them or maybe take a break with one of them. And during that course of time, he will ask, well, how do you like it here? How do they treat you here? And he may get the answer that he's looking for, but most times these people, his employee will go a step further and say, well, it's not going so good. I have two other jobs that I have to go to. Uh, and then that employee will tell the undercover boss his particular set of circumstances. Well, my mother's sick. Uh, my brother just passed away and I'm helping to take care of his children, his family. I'm going to lose my house. I don't have money, enough money to pay my rent, whatever the case may be. Now, what happens as well is, you know, the, the, the boss will get the story, and then later on he invites the different workers to the corporate headquarters. And then he, that's when he reveals himself with his nice three-piece suit or whatever the case may be. And half the time the employee will recognize him, half the time they won't. But... What it relates to, he completely forgot about the operation of his business. And he will ask the employee, make reference to whatever the problem that he had, the situation that he had. And then he'll address that. I've seen some episodes where the boss would buy a house for somebody, buy someone else a brand new car because they don't have the means to get to work. They have to take three buses and then walk the last mile to get to work. Well, he'll go out and buy him a car. I've seen other, other bosses provide a home for a family that's in need. I've seen other, other shows where maybe in, there was an addition to a house. But what I'm getting at is the person that's in charge takes it upon himself or herself to say, hey, look, I have this person, this employee that's in need that I knew nothing about. I, didn't, I wasn't aware that they had these problems, but I'm going to do what I can to help alleviate that problem and fix that. And that's what ends up happening. And then the other thing that happens, sadly to say, is 
and it's usually around Christmas time, people get this really touchy feel good feeling on themselves, and they want to be helpful towards other people. So maybe they'll see somebody in line at the store making the decision, hey, I'm going to pay for this person's purchase just to do it. Now, could that be considered being a good Samaritan? Yeah, I could on one hand. Um, not to put myself on any kind of a pedestal or anything, but what I do once in a while is when I'm at a restaurant and I see some military people, without them knowing about it, without I'll go and acknowledge them while they're sitting down, but I'll get a hold of the waiter and say, hey, I want to pay for his meal. I want to pay for their meal. And, you know, you don't have to tell them, you know, don't tell them it was me. I just, I just want to do that. Um, sometimes I'll see police officers or firemen in the same situation. I will go up and, and pay for their lunch or pay for their meal, whatever the case may be. And do I expect anything back from them? No, I don't. But it's just a little act of kindness. And it's unfortunate that I see, in my opinion, that that only generally seems to happen around the holidays, especially around Christmas time. Why can't we just do that? You know, as we go along through our own life, it's not going to hurt us. It's not going to kill us. Okay, so I'm up 10 bucks, 20 bucks, whatever the case may be. But the point is that you're, you're helping somebody that you don't know. You're helping a stranger. And we have no idea what that little impact is going to accomplish down the road. So who's your neighbor? Yeah, everyone is your neighbor. Now, it doesn't necessarily have to physically be your neighbor next door. It could be anyone that you come in contact that has a need, that, that just needs a little bit of help. And, you know, we're called to do that. You know, we need to be compassionate. We need to be merciful. Because how can we expect the same thing from God if we're not willing to do that for our own fellow man? And it's not that hard. You, you'll find, surprisingly, that if you do it once or twice, you do it again, and again, it gets easier, just like anything else you do repetitively. So, with that in mind, I'm going to close out the, the parable of the, the Good Samaritan. And there's, everyone has the potential to be a Samaritan any day of your life. And to take it one step further, that could be a test on God's part. He's testing you, testing us. To see how we're going to act, how we're going to respond to this person over here or this person over here. They may have a need. And if we can fulfill it, why shouldn't we? So with that in mind, I'm going to conclude tonight's lesson. And we're going to close out with a short prayer. Heavenly Father, once again, we come before you. We're thankful for the opportunity and the time that we've had to learn about a portion of your word, study a portion of your word. Take this parable of the Good Samaritan to heart. There's plenty of people out there that are in need of our help and in need of our love and compassion, and we should be able to share that. No questions asked. Nothing expected in return. Just We should just do it. Um, and we've heard, this, we've heard the term, there but for the grace of God go I. And it could very easily just be any one of us. So... We should be here on this earth while we're here, showing compassion and showing love to our fellow man. We thank you for the gifts and blessings of this life, knowing that they come from you through your grace and your mercy and your kindness. And we thank you most of all, though, for the gift of your Son. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. And
Thank you again for joining us this evening. Remember, you'll be getting an email. If you haven't downloaded the new church app, download it. You can find the link on the church website. You can find it on Facebook. If you can't find it there, then give me a text, shoot me a message. I'll send it to you personally. But download the app. You're going to start seeing notifications. If you want to become part of the daily Bible reading and the devotionals, there's a separate tab you can push and turn that on. And you will receive to your device through the app a daily Bible reading and devotional every single day. I'm glad you joined us. Thank you again. Let's bow and close out in prayer. Father, thank you for this night. We thank you for the lesson that was given. Lord, we pray that we can take it to heart and treat everyone as our neighbor. Father, we thank you and we love you. We ask all this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.